All right, so in the last video, we learned about stimulus control. As a reminder of that idea, here's an example. A first grader learns that saying went in the presence of a flashcard with letters W, E, N, T results in praise. But the same response to a flashcard with the letters C, A, M, E does not get praise. In other words, the kid is learning to discriminate between those sets of letters and to have different behavior for each of them. That's part of learning language is that learning discrimination. So for this video, we're just gonna keep building on that idea of operant discrimination and go into some more detail, like how we can measure how much discrimination an individual is showing and some applications of this stuff. So to start, how do we measure discrimination? Like, how do we know how well a kid is doing at telling apart different words or how well a cat has learned to distinguish between the chair it's allowed to climb on and the chair it's not allowed to climb on? We do this by calculating what's called a discrimination index. Though it's written I with a little subscript D, so you might think of it as index of discrimination if you like. All it is would be the rate of behavior that they do when the SD is present divided by that plus the rate of behavior they do when the S delta is present. Like how many times does the rat press the lever when the green light was on divided by the total number of times he pressed the lever, like the number of times when the green light was on plus the number of times when the red light was on. So if you pressed it 500 times when the green light is on, you'd write 500 up top, and 100 times when the red light is on, so you'd put 100 down here and 500 still goes here, then we've got 500 divided by 600. That would be 0.83, if you plug it into your calculator, meaning 83% of the behaviors are for the green light, right? The one where we want them to do the one, the one where they get reinforcement for it. Now, if they only do the response to your SD, the one that gets reinforced, and they show zero responses to the S delta, the one where there's no reinforcement, then what's the discrimination index? What does the ID come out to? Pause the video a moment and try to answer this one. Well, since S delta is zero, right? You can just plug a zero in here. You kind of take that out of the equation. You see that it's SD, whatever the rate was, over SD. Anything divided by itself always comes out to one. So the discrimination index here is one if they don't respond to the S delta at all. That would actually be perfect discrimination, right? They're perfect at telling apart when to respond or not based on the stimuli that are present. They only respond when the SD is there. In other words, the stimuli have perfect control over the behavior, perfectly predict what the person or animal will do. How about if they can't tell apart the SD and the S delta at all? Or if they just don't care and they choose to respond the same? Like if they do just as much behavior to each of those two stimuli, the one we reinforce them for and the one we don't reinforce them for, what would the discrimination index be? Again, pause the video a moment and try to figure that out. If you're not sure, it may help to just plug in some numbers. Like if they did 100 behaviors to the SD and 100 behaviors to the S delta, right? If they're treating them the same, then plug that into the equation, you get 100 divided by 100 and 100. So 100 over 200 comes out to 0.5 is the discrimination index. But remember, this was if they literally don't treat the stimuli any differently. They behave the same to both of them as if they can't even tell them apart. So a discrimination index of 0.5 is no discrimination at all. They're equally likely to do the response in the presence of either stimulus, so there's no distinction there. Now, what would a discrimination index of zero mean? Pause for a moment. Well, it means you probably screwed up your discrimination training or you, you screwed up the differential reinforcement procedure in some way. Like it means they can't tell, or it means they can tell apart the stimuli and they do respond differently to them, but for some reason they respond to the one you don't want them to and they've got a zero when the SD is there. They're not responding at all to the SD. Like, that doesn't really make sense. You never see a discrimination index of zero. It doesn't really happen. It would mean you did something super wrong or maybe you were just recording numbers in the wrong column of your data sheet. So really the discrimination index will basically always be between 0.5 and 1.0. It'll be between 50% and 100%. Basically 50, the, the 0.5, that's no discrimination. 
whereas 1.0, 100%, that's perfect discrimination. So the, the ID value should always be between 0.5 and 1.0. Now let's see an example application where real life researchers use the discrimination index in their research. So you may know that dogs have two types of cones in their eyes that pick up different wavelengths of light and allow them to see some colors, but not others. That's actually different than humans. So often people will say dogs are colorblind or dogs don't see like red, they're red, green colorblind or something like that. That's because we're comparing to humans. Humans generally have three types of cones for a short, medium and long wavelengths of light. But sometimes these are called red cones, green cones, and blue cones, just after the perceptual experience we have when that specific type of cone is activated a lot and other types aren't, right? So if one of these, this one is activated a lot then and the others aren't, then, then we'll see it as green or something like that. So since we have, you know, more types of cones than dogs, we can tell, tell apart more types of colors. We can discriminate more colors than dogs can. Though some humans, by the way, usually males, are colorblind in some way, where, for example, they might be lacking one type of cone and thus unable to distinguish some of the colors that look totally distinct to the rest of us. In fact, some women, some human women, are born with a mutation that gives them extra types of cones. It gives them four types of cones, and those women can discriminate color differences between two things where the rest of us all think they're the exact same color. So we're all kind of colorblind relative to those you know, rare women. Also, many birds have four types of cones, and we've shown in a lot of research they can tell apart lots of subtle color differences that to our human eyes might look like identical hues. And butterflies, they've got five types of cones, so presumably they're seeing colors and color differences that we can't. These drawings, by the way, that I'm showing here, they're from the webcomic called The Oatmeal. He describes it as butterflies seeing a massive spectrum of color that our, our brains aren't even capable of processing. Then in this webcomic of his, he goes on to describe this badass little mantis shrimp, a creature that not only can punch with the force of a 22 caliber bullet, but also happens to have 16 types of cones, he says. Though it turns out he, he got that detail wrong. They actually have 12 types of cones. But still, holy crap, right? Whoa. So in the comic, he asks us to try to imagine what a mantis shrimp sees in a rainbow and describes it as a thermonuclear bomb of light and beauty, the richest, most harmonious chorus of colors imaginable. So this graph here, this, this shows the wavelengths of light. So down here, these are just different wavelengths of light from about 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers. This is the, the visible spectrum for human sight. And these are where our three different types of cones go off for different stimuli of light. So something at like 550 will turn on the, the quote unquote green cones and the quote unquote red cones quite a bit, but won't turn on the blue cones at all. They don't go off for 550. If something's at like 420, then only the blue cones go off a fair amount. None of the red and green ones go off and we'll perceive that as blue. That's kind of the idea. For the mantis shrimp though, they've got 12 different types of cones, all with sort of special sensitivities. So there's wavelengths of light that each of those 12 types of cones is sensitive to. Compared to the wavelengths, our three types of human cones will detect Obviously, that means way, 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 way more combinations of light waves that could be distinguished and discriminated, right? But here's the thing. Doing a dissection and counting the types of cones in their eyes doesn't actually tell us a damn thing about the colors they can see. In fact, a 2014 study in the journal Science looked at color vision in the mantis shrimp by measuring the discrimination index. Right, the I with a little d, the discrimination index for various pairs of colors that were either super similar or kind of similar or pretty different colors, just to see which ones the mantis shrimp can tell apart and how much better they are than us humans. Now, whether you're a human or a bird or a dog or a mantis shrimp, you can certainly tell apart that a red light and a blue light are different, right? They're just so different, it's very easy for most creatures with eyes to tell that those are different. But what about like a dark red versus a slightly darker red? or a green versus just a slightly lighter green. Some hues are just too similar for us humans to tell apart, but you've got to imagine the mantis shrimp would ace a test like that, given all their types of cones, right? Turns out though, they suck ass at discriminating colors. They're, they're like decent at colors that are 50 to 100 nanometers apart, that are like really far apart, but us humans can distinguish colors that are 
just one to four nanometers apart. So the mantis shrimp is actually horrible at discriminating colors, even when they're pretty drastically different shades. Like, they can learn to respond correctly when red leads to a treat and blue leads to a shock. But if you try rewarding them for dark red and shocking them for orangish red, they just can't solve that task. It's too similar for them. Turns out their brains actually just process light differently than other creatures. Those extra cones aren't really used the same way extra cones are in our brain. They're actually used in mantis shrimp for temporal discrimination, for, for timing info of vision, and not color discrimination, which they kind of suck at. So we see that the physiology alone, the biology alone, can't actually tell us what a creature is able to see, but the discrimination index can. It tells us about the psychology of the animal, its subjective experience, in a way a dissection never could. Now, obviously, we have to learn to discriminate things through experience. That's what learning is, right? It's changing your behavior based on experience. So for a pigeon to learn that, say, pecking a dark red button will get a reward, but pecking a light red button won't get a reward, it has to have some experience of trying out the behavior when each of those lights are on, right? So if discrimination is something we learn, the question is, what determines how fast that learning happens? What determines how big the discrimination index is at any given time or after a certain number of experiences? In other words, imagine you want a larger discrimination index, like you want your dog to respond differently to two different verbal prompts. What can you do to get the most discrimination or to get that taught the quickest? So first, giving lots of training will get you a larger discrimination index. In other words, it'll go up over time as you have more experience, and the more experience you get, the higher that, that gets, the, the larger the index of discrimination. That's kind of obvious, but what else? Well, one of the biggest things you can do to improve discrimination and, and learn it faster is to use stimuli that are very distinct. So instead of using a dark red button and a light red button, you might use a red button and a blue button. They're very distinct, right? So look at the graph over here on the right. Each line is a different condition that was tested. This is real data. So let's look at them separately. Let's just look at the, the bottom line here. So we're, we're gonna look at the solid thick black line. There they did discrimination training where the SD, the rewarded stimulus, was a 70 hertz tone, but the S delta, where they weren't rewarded, was if a 60 hertz tone came on. So they do a bunch of these trials. You can see for hours and hours and hours they're doing these trials. But for a while, right, after even after 200 hours, so when we get about here, 200 hours is gone, you can see they, they are figuring it out. There's a discrimination index of about 0.8. They can tell these two sounds apart. They know when to respond on one and not the other. But the discrimination index barely gets over 0.8. It doesn't get up to anywhere near perfect, right? Now look at the dashed line, right? The next one up, this dashed line here. In that case, the, the SD was 80 hertz, whereas the S delta was 60 hertz again. So they're a little more distinct now. And sure enough, the discrimination index gets higher overall, but not only that, it goes up faster, right? It takes fewer hours of practicing this for them to, to learn and figure out which one they should respond to. They learn faster and they learn better by the end. And then the other two lines here, they used even more distinct stimuli, like 100 hertz versus 60 hertz. And you can see that got the best learning, the highest discrimination index, but also the learning occurred fastest in that case. So if you want to train your dog to do different behaviors when you make different sounds, make sure you use words that don't sound similar. Or for hand movements, make sure your hand movements are distinct enough, and then your discrimination training will work better and faster. Fewer trials needed. There are also training procedures you can use to ensure that the individual makes almost no mistakes to get them up to pretty perfect discrimination so that they don't do the behavior at all when the S delta is present. This is called errorless discrimination. Basically, what you want to do is make a wrong answer nearly impossible. So you start with super easy discrimination or, or very obvious hints, or maybe even forcing them to do the corrective behavior and then rewarding it. And then you gradually increment towards a more challenging discrimination or towards giving less and less of a hint. So basically, if you don't allow, allow errors along the way, if they're always getting it right, 
during the training, then you can actually train them up to near perfect discrimination performance, like a discrimination index near 1.0. But there is a downside to errorless discrimination if you do that as a training. The downside is it's hard to reverse or, or undo. So if you want flexible behavior, you want someone that can adapt when circumstances change, this isn't necessarily ideal. Now, here in this video, I want to show you an example of, of how this idea is used in applied behavior analysis, where they sometimes call it errorless teaching. You'll see the teacher here giving hints to ensure the kid gets it right, sometimes even forcing the kid to get it right, and, and the kid thus is getting reinforced a lot. They're getting a lot of contact with reinforcement in order to help notice what works and what doesn't, and then they slowly start sort of fading out their hints, we call it fading, just kind of giving less and less hints, so the kid is eventually doing it all by themselves. So here's the example. Touch my ears. There they are. Where's my ears? You got it. Up oh, good. Touch my nose. Mm-hmm. Touch my ears. Touch my ears. There they are. Good. Where's my ears? Good. So another thing you may have noticed is that the instructor was not allowing mistakes and she was using prompting to keep the child successful. This is known as errorless teaching. Errorless teaching is a technique that is used when introducing a new skill or behavior. All responses are prompted so the learner is correct and has frequent opportunities to contact reinforcement. With errorless learning, the teacher delivers the instruction with prompts to ensure the success of the learner and allow more opportunities for our learner to contact reinforcement. By teaching errorlessly, the student is less likely to exhibit escape or avoidant behaviors that get in the way of learning because he is able to contact reinforcement more frequently. No one likes to do something they're going to do wrong. This is the same with our learners. By giving our learners all the opportunities to be right, they will want to continue learning because contact with reinforcement is more frequent. Here are the steps to using errorless teaching. On the first trial, present the SD with a full prompt, then reinforce the response. Show me hot dog. That's a hot dog, wow. Show me hot dog. Yep, that's right. Mm -hmm. As your learner shows increased confidence in performing the task more independently, start fading your prompts from more intrusive to less intrusive. Continue using errorless teaching with your new targets. As you fade prompts, you will need to ensure that the learner's responses are evoked by the SD rather than the prompt by using transfer trials. Okay, we'll come back to some of this stuff when we talk about applied behavior analysis later in the course. For now, one last thing I want to talk about with operant discrimination, it gets back to the idea we learned about earlier of multiple schedules, the like the MOLT FR10 and FR20, where we might switch back and forth between a situation where they get rewarded on a fixed ratio 10 schedule and a situation where they get rewarded on a fixed ratio 20 schedule. We called that a multiple schedule setup, MOLT FR10, FR20, right? So now for this, for this next bit, I want you to imagine a, a scenario with me. I want you to imagine you're a comparative psychologist, you're out in the Democratic Republic of Congo doing field work, maybe you're observing chimpanzee tool use behavior. One thing that chimps do, it's called termite fishing. They'll choose a stick, they strip the leaves off until it's just a straight stick, then they dip it down into a termite mound. And the termites, they defend the nest, they attack the stick, they jump onto the stick, then the chimp will pull it out and they eat the termites off of it. Basically, they've invented utensils. So Imagine you're a comparative psychologist watching this and you note for this, this you know, set of chimps you're watching, this one chimp you're watching, there are very two, two kind of like very similar food sites right nearby. They give roughly equal payoff for the chimps. Similar amounts of food at each of these two food sites. You'll probably see the chimps spending roughly equal time at both sites. My question for you is, 
How will a chimp's behavior change if site one suddenly runs low on termites? Like, let's say there's rain flooding that, that floods the mound or, or other chimps eat all the termites there or something like that. Pause the video a second and make a prediction about how the behavior will change if site one runs low. So you probably guessed that they'd start spending more time at site two, more foraging behavior at that other location, which is totally correct and not very surprising. Now, imagine a pigeon on a molt FR30, FR30 setup, okay? When the red light is on, it's 30 pecks per tree. When the blue light is on, it's 30 pecks per tree. What would you predict for the general pattern of how much the, the pigeon pecks during the red light versus the blue light? Well, likely we would see a similar rate of behavior in both cases, right? Since it's the same payoff on both of the schedules. Now, what would you predict if we switch to a molt FR30 EXT setup? where the red light means we put them on an FR30 schedule and the blue light means extinction, no reinforcing of the behavior. After we do this for a while in this changed circumstance, what do you predict for their behavior in these two situations? Pause the video and come up with a specific prediction here. Well, what happens is the pecking will go down during extinction. They'll stop responding much or at all when the blue light is on. That makes sense, but something weird happens here that you might not have predicted. Their rate of behavior actually goes up on the FR30 schedule. They do a higher rate of behavior when the red light is on than they used to do for the same red light, even though the schedule of reinforcement hasn't changed for the red light. That's really pretty surprising. We haven't changed the schedule of reinforcement in that context, but the pigeon's behavior changed in that context just due to what's happening in other situations in its life. What we described is actually an effect. It's called behavioral contrast. You can think of it like the pigeon is contrasting or comparing the two schedules rather than treating them totally independently. So behavioral contrast, we give a definition. We could say it's when we see an inverse correlation between the rate of reinforcement on one schedule and the rate of responding on the other schedule. So if one part starts paying off less, right, it's a change in the rate of reinforcement. One, start, one, one part of those, one schedule, starts paying off less. Basically, I work extra hard on the other part. When that happens, we, we call that positive contrast, so positive behavioral contrast. Whereas, if one part starts paying off more than it used to, I'm going to get kind of lazier about the other part, right? And we call that negative contrast. So both of these, behavior contrast, it's weird. It's weird since you might expect that an FR30 schedule always leads to the same basic rate of responding for any pigeon that's hungry. In fact, that's what dozens and dozens and dozens of studies had already shown. You get a very consistent and very predictable rate of responding to a particular schedule of reinforcement. Now, if you change that schedule of reinforcement, the rate of behavior changes with it in a very predictable way. But if you keep the schedule of reinforcement the same, their behavior stays the same. That's steady state responding. We learned all about that with schedules of reinforcement. So the schedule of reinforcement should be dictating how much they do the behavior, right? The schedule seems to control behavior. Yet here, we find a change in behavior without a change in the schedule itself. Just a change in some other schedule happening at some other time. So let's test this out. Imagine I've trained a rat or my kid on a molt VI 60 second VI 60 second setup, right? So two schedules, I do each of them for a little while, like an hour where a blue light is on and the schedule is VI 60 seconds, and then an hour where the red light is on and the same basic schedule is happening. You may want to pause the video a moment and, and just remind yourself what a VI 60 second schedule means. So with VI 60 seconds, it means they just if they just got a treat for the behavior, they've got to wait around 60 or so seconds before the behavior can pay off again. It's kind of unpredictable since it's variable variable interval schedule. So it might sometimes be just 20 or 30 seconds they got to wait, sometimes longer than 60 seconds. Right, that's, that's the idea of variable interval. We know from before that with a VI schedule like this, what kind of responding do we get? We get a nice consistent rate of responding. There's no post reinforcer pause, just a consistent rate of responding. Nothing crazy, it's not a high rate like a VR schedule, 
but still it's consistent and steady. And actually because of this, VI schedules are used in a lot of behavior analysis studies because you can get a nice predictable baseline going and then we can see what happens when you change some uh, independent variable. Now, in this case, right, we've got a MULT VI60, VI60, where we're gonna see a pretty equal rate of behavior during each of those schedules. Like during the hour of red light or the hour of blue light, they do a similar number of behaviors. The question for you is, if I switch to a MULT VI60 second, VI30 second setup, how might the rate of behavior change in each of those components? Pause the video, try and think it out. Well, first off, what does a VI 30 second schedule mean? It means they get a treat roughly every 30 seconds instead of having to wait a whole minute or so each time. So the VI 30 second schedule gives more treats overall and we'll see a higher rate of responding on that schedule now. So the one we changed, we would expect to see a higher rate of responding. But that means because of behavioral contrast, we're also going to see a lower rate of responding on the schedule that stayed VI 60 seconds. Now, what kind of contrast would that be? Positive or negative contrast? Pause and see if you can get it. So here's a reminder from the last slide. In this case, one part started paying off more, so I got lazier on the other part. This would be negative contrast. All right, now imagine instead that starting from a VI60, VI60, I switch to a VI60 and extinction, right? How might the rate of behavior change in each of those components, going from a VI60, VI60 to this new schedule at the bottom here? Pause and make a prediction. So in the extinction condition, we would expect the rate of behavior to go down, eventually maybe to zero, but Due to behavioral contrast, we would expect a higher rate of responding during the other option, even though we haven't changed its schedule of reinforcement at all. So in this case, it would be considered positive contrast. That's if one part starts paying off less, I work extra hard on the other part. That's what's going on here. In other words, now that schedule two sucks ass, it makes schedule one look more positive. Whereas negative contrast would be if schedule two starts being awesome, it makes schedule one look more negative. That's negative contrast. Now, why does behavioral contrast matter? It's actually super important because it shows that it isn't always the absolute rate of payoff that controls our behavior, but the relative rate of payoff, the relative rate of reinforcement. Kind of like how a teenager working their first job might be happy at $8 an hour until they find out they could have been getting $10 an hour or how in some countries where the, the pay is a lot lower, a factory worker might work really hard to get $1 every thousand units they produce in the factory. While in other countries, that would not be a high enough rate of reinforcement to get a very fast behavior out of the worker. Things are kind of relative, right? The way we, res we respond to schedules of reinforcement is calibrated by other things, other experiences other situations and schedules where we may be able to get more or less payoff for similar work. Basically, the way I respond to situation A is determined not just by the specifics of situation A, but also by how it compares to situation B or C or D. So a more intuitive kind of real life example might be a college student who works a couple of part-time jobs as a barista. So the person's working at two different coffee shops. Imagine both coffee shops pay $10 an hour and the locations are super similar in all other ways. So for a college student, this rate of pay, this schedule of reinforcement might be sufficient to get a pretty high rate of behavior. Like you're happy to pick up shifts and work those hours, right? But now imagine something changes. Imagine you get a raise at coffee shop B to $15 an hour. Well, thanks to that comparison, Right, thanks to the relative rate of money payoff between the two options, you'll probably stop picking up shifts at Coffee Shop A, even though the rate of reinforcement at Coffee Shop A hasn't changed. Last week, you were stoked for the opportunity to work for that $10 an hour, but now, not so much. That is behavioral contrast. In this case, it's negative contrast because you now see that same schedule, the $10 an hour, as more negative based on changes in some other situations in your life. All right, we'll stop there for now. We've talked a lot about discrimination in operant conditioning, but what about generalization? We'll hit that in the next video, and then we'll see how this stuff applies to some more complex learning concepts.